Periscope family, you're welcome to join in. Thank you so join much. Us. Join us. Join in. <laughs> Tell them. <laughs> Upon your name, O oh Lord, the name that is holy, we call upon your name, O oh Lord, the name that is holy, we call upon your name, O oh Lord, we come to bring our praise to the one who was, who is.
Glory, glory, glory. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory to you, Jesus. Glory to you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. 
we give you praise today. We thank you, Father, for you are great and greatly to be praised. This is the day you've made, and we are rejoicing, and we're glad in it. Hallelujah. Oh, we give you praise today. We love you today, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You said, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Well, we have breath today. So we lift our voice and give you praise. We give you honor today and thanksgiving today. We love you today. Oh, hallelujah. You are so wonderful, Father. You are such a wonderful Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, our desire is to give you oh, to, 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 a praise and to please you, Father, every day, all day long. Oh, to take Zakai. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What an honor to be able to praise you, Father. What an honor to be able to come to you in the name of Jesus. What an honor, Father. Oh, we glorify that name. We glorify the name of Jesus, the most powerful name in the universe. Father, we thank you for that name. We thank you for that name that's above every name. That is the name of Jesus. Every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of you, Father. The glory of God. Hallelujah. We worship you today. We worship you today. We honor you today. We love you today. Oh, receive our praise, Father. Receive our praise. Receive our praise, Father. Oh, to take Zakai. Let him hear your voice, church. Hallelujah. He's so good. He lets us hear his voice by the Holy Spirit every day. Let him hear you praise him. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we thank you for the word of God and the joy of the Lord is our strength every day. Every day we stir ourselves up to give you praise. Every day we're thankful, Father. Oh, we serve you with joyfulness and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. That even today you give us our breath. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we thank you today. We thank you today. We thank you for our great salvation. Thank you, Jesus. What a great salvation. What a great salvation, Jesus. What a great life you've given us, Father. Life and life abundantly every day, and we partake of it. Oh, the table set, Father. And we partake of it every day in Jesus' name. We stir ourselves up. Oh, to recognize you and recount all the things you do for us every day, every day, every day. From the time we get up till we go to bed, you're always there watching over us, prompting us, leading us, guiding us. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, we have a reason to rejoice. We have a reason to be happy. We have a reason to be full of the, the, the joy of the Lord. Oh, and for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To fill this place, to fill our lives every day, every day, every day. Not once in a while, but every day your presence is oh to take Zakai all around about us. Thank you for that, Jesus. Thank you for it, Father. Oh, we thank you today. We thank you today. We are full of the praise of God. We are full of the praises of God because we recognize, oh yes, how wonderful you are, Father. How wonderful you are. Jesus, we recognize that every day. Oh, your mighty Father. Oh, your mighty Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, your glorious Father. Your wonderful Father. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Glorious Savior, Glorious Savior, our Redeemer, our Risen King, Hallelujah, oh Hallelujah, 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 oh praise the Lord, Hallelujah, Glory to you Jesus, Hallelujah, oh praise you, Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 
Jesus loves us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So brighten up. <laughs> and let get out, greet everybody, let them know that you're glad they're here and there is something special in the word just for them today. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Sunday weekend. <laughs> uh, I know Jeff and Cherie, were, were they Cabo or on a cruise? They're at Ca in Cabo. They're Jeff's brother uh, and uh, wife, I guess, and Jeff and Cherie are down there fellowshipping, having a good time, and, and uh, we believe that God is going to use Jeff to minister. Amen. Amen. And Cherie too, praise the Lord. But we miss them. We miss you all when you're not here. And uh, I believe there's more on their way, praise God. Hallelujah. I want to give you an update on some stuff. On our Google page, uh, we still haven't gotten that one one star removed or replaced with a five star. Whoever did it uh, hasn't redone it. Uh, they gave us a great review, but then they gave us one star because they didn't understand how the stars worked. So we're going we're gonna to get that corrected because we got all five stars. Anyway, we have had, and get this, 893 people have viewed our page on Google. And what span time? Span of time? Well, we've only had it up about six weeks. Okay, so within so that six. That's, you're being recorded. Please don't do that. Oh. You, if everybody can hear everything you say, yeah. we don't need that. All right. Um, the um, uh, let's see. The last men's no, not where is that? The last Wednesday. No, no, I've got the wrong information here on these other things. Okay, um, well, I don't know where the page is now that I had. Anyway, I wanted to give you an update on all the stuff that's been happening. We have 171, I know this, 171 views of um, the, la the number three uh, on... Um, Living in prophetic times. I had to stop and go back through the messages. Living in prophetic times. Uh, number three, which was kind of a, it was an ending and a re, re um, what do you call it? Recap. Uh, and I guess you can call it recap, review. Uh, we had, uh, as of this morning, 171 views. That's the most we've had of any individual message. And uh, so that's really good. Praise God. Somebody's interested in that, apparently. <laughs> and then on Wednesday nights, we're averaging between 70 and 80 views, which is really good. Uh, we've been averaging about the same on Sunday mornings the last few weeks. Uh, and uh, last week, Mary was up to 80. I don't have my the notes I made before the service. I don't have them in front of me. I don't know where they went. Uh, let me see. 86 views was what uh, from Mary's uh, uh, message. Uh, not, was it not last week? Was it last week? Last week. Yeah, last week. So in one week's time, 86 views. That's pretty good. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we've been getting some good response. Now, out of those 893 people that have visited our Google page, I believe they're going to start visiting the church. Amen. 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 That's that's a pretty good response. So I believe they're going to start coming to the services, and they're going to get blessed. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right. Get some air up here. How's it? Well, it still says 70 degrees, but it feels warmer than that to me. Anyway, I just want to share that with you. That's really exciting things. Um, next Men's Fellowship will be on the 27th. Finally got the right date on that. 
and we got a sign up sheet so I'm going to hand it to uh, Jack let him start it um, so we need to know how many people are coming and if you're going to bring somebody we just need to know who you are put your name on there and uh, how many you expect to be with you if it's just you just put one amen all right praise the Lord uh, let's see, Timothy Club, if you haven't signed up for it this month, um, obviously we're halfway through the month already, but um, you can see uh, Josh about that, and that gets you the notes. And if you want to get the notes, you can do that. I think that's all. Do we have any other announcements? No? Okay. Uh, I think that's it for announcements. And uh, I want to pray in the Spirit here for a couple minutes. Just, just close your eyes and begin to pray in, in the Spirit. Kumbrahasatalavesobokrahasatalavesatalavesobokrahasatalavesobokrahasatalavesobokrahasatalavesobokrahasatalavesobokrahasatalavesobokrahasatalavesobokrahasatalavesobokrahasatalavesobokrah
they're really for me. So when I have them on my iPad, it's a whole lot easier, and I can just you know scroll up or scroll down in the notes. Um, so that's why I said I'm still believing for my new iPad. Anyway, um, you find Acts chapter eight. I'm going to read from the Amplified translation, and uh, chapter eight, verse five. Philip, the deacon, not the apostle. I didn't put that in there. That's Amplified translation. <laughs> went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ. Now, what's the word Christ mean? Anointed one. The anointed one and his anointing. Whenever that word Christ is used, you need to think the anointed one and his anointing. Amen? Okay, so it preached the anointed one and his anointing to them. But when they believed the good news, the gospel, about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, and his anointing, as Philip preached it, they were baptized, both men and women. All right, so what happened to them at that point? They received Jesus, right? And then they got baptized. The, and the, the baptism is a baptism to, we understand water baptism today, we get baptized to give an outward sign of an inward work. Amen? And there's nothing that says you have to be baptized in water to go to heaven. Now, there's some people that believe that. It's not Bible, okay? It's for us. It's for us to get a, an, uh, an illustration in our own lives of what happened inside. We were washed by the blood of Jesus. Amen? And, and that's why we get water baptized. We not only want to identify with it ourselves through this ceremony, if you would, but we want to let the people around us know that there's been an inward change. <clears throat> now, verse 14, when the apostles or special messengers at Jerusalem heard that they... Uh, that the country of Samaria had accepted and welcomed the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And they came down and prayed for them that the Samaritans might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then the apostles laid their hands on them one by one, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, out of the seven times in the New Testament that we have a record of people being, receiving the Holy Spirit, being baptized in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, whichever term you like to use, they're all right. Seven records of that happening, seven different instances. Five of them specifically tell us that the first evidence was that they spoke in tongues. The other two, in which this is one of them, tells us they received, but how does anybody know they received? Unless there's the evidence. Amen? And it says they received. So there must have been some evidence because actually tongues and interpretation of tongues is really the only or the only gifts that are new to the new covenant. Prophecy was in the Old Testament. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge was in the Old Testament. Um, uh, what else is there? The gifts of healings, the work of miracles. These were all in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. So the only thing that was added was tongues and interpretation of tongues. So in order for somebody to say, well, that person received, there had to be some evidence. And it's the evidence of the New Testament evidence of the filling of, with the Spirit or baptism of the Holy Ghost. So it says that they had believed and they had been baptized, but they had not yet been filled with the Spirit. So what happens? The disciples come down there. They pray for them, lay their hands on them, and they receive. Now, I'm not doing a, a, a message this morning on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but this is a step along the path of what I want to get to, all right? But a second experience. Some people say, well, when I got born again, I got all that God has. No, you didn't. <laughs> you got born again. Your spirit man got recreated. The life and nature of God was imparted to you. But the baptism of the Holy Ghost may not, in most cases, did, was not imparted to you. Because that's a separate gift. Jesus said, if you ask the Father for the gift of the Holy Spirit, he will grant him to you or give him to you. And, and so there's a place where we desire that next step, which is the infilling, fully filled with the Holy Spirit himself. Now, the Spirit of God, the Father, and Jesus, our Lord, we got. But the Holy Spirit is another comforter, Jesus said. He said, well, I'm going away. You can't go. You won't see me. But I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send another comforter. And he'll abide with you. And he'll be in you. Amen? 
And that's what happens when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now go to Acts chapter 19, again, Amplified Translation. Good to have some folks joining us online this morning. Hallelujah. By the way, all of you that are watching, uh, if you live in the area, when I say the area, I mean, you know, 45 minutes away is the area. So if you live within 45 minutes driving time, uh, man, make the effort to get here. There's nothing like being in a live service. It's nice to be able to watch it online, but that's not what God said. He said, don't forsake assembling, coming together, not sitting home watching. If that's it's the only choice you've got, then praise God you're watching. But man, make the effort. If you live in the area, get here and assemble together because there's a, an anointing that's released when we assemble together. Amen? All right, verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul went through the upper inland districts and came down to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. So what did he find? Disciples. disciples. That means they were believers. Right? He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed on Jesus as the Christ, or the anointed one and his anointing? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Ghost or a Holy Spirit. So they didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit, and they, didn't, they had not yet received that they said, no, we didn't even know such a thing existed. Uh, so what happens next? He goes on, and in verse 3, uh, he says, into what baptism then were you baptized? They said, John's baptism. Paul said, well, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, continually telling people they should believe on the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus, having a conviction of, uh, uh, full of the joyful trust that he is the anointed one with his anointing, right? The Messiah, and being obedient to him. On hearing this, they were baptized again, and this time in the name of the Lord Jesus. And as Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues. This is not one of the ones where it specifically says that. And prophesied. All right. So we have two instances here where there was a clear second experience. Now, not all the other ones uh, are clear on that, but this was clear. Now, when somebody gets born again, there there are those that, when they first got born again, that they did receive the Holy Spirit. They did speak in tongues. Didn't even know what it was. All right. Sometimes that happens, but that's not the most common. The most common is a person gets born again. And then after they're born again, somebody tells them, well, you need to receive the Holy Spirit. And, and then they begin to seek or they pray. And then some, maybe somebody lays hands on them or they're doing it by themselves. But they receive the Holy Spirit. And, and then sometimes they'll actually start speaking out in tongues without any instruction of any kind. Now, we've seen in our 45 years plus of ministry that most people need instruction about speaking in tongues. They need to understand the Holy Spirit doesn't make you do anything. That this is something that comes up from out the inside of you, but you have to allow it to do that. And some people are fearful, they're intimidated, they're afraid the devil lies to them and says, well, you know, you're just making it up, or you're just copying somebody else. But the fact is that once you open up and you begin to lift your voice, the Holy Spirit then can give you utterance, give you the words, the sounds, because at first they don't sound like words at all. And, and no foreign language ever sounds like a language you know if you've never heard it before. Every word sounds strange to you. Amen? And, and so when you begin to receive the Holy Spirit and you begin to pray in tongues or in the Spirit, as Paul says, then you are going to begin to speak out sounds you've never heard before. And, and it's going to sound strange. But as you by faith speak them out, you find out the Holy Spirit is giving you utterance, the Bible says. He gives you the sounds, the new language, but you have to be willing to speak it out. And I usually instruct people, uh, when we pray for you, you know, we're going to lay hands on you. And, uh, you know, think about when you speak English, that's your natural earthly language that man's wisdom taught you when you went to school at home. Man's wisdom teaches you the language of your culture, right? And so uh, we all grew up, you know, learning English because it was spoken in our homes, uh, because we went to school and they taught us English and, and so forth. So that's man's wisdom teaching us man's language. But when the Holy Spirit teaches, it's a wholly different, di different thing because it comes by the prompting inside. 
It's not from outside. It's not from head. It's not from reason. It's not from education. It's a prompting that comes from inside by the Holy Spirit that you have received. But you have to take a breath. I mean, let's face it. When you speak, these are mechanics. You take a breath, and then you raise your voice, and then you form the sounds into words and speak them out. Right? Those are the mechanics of speaking. I don't care what language you're speaking, those are the same mechanics. Well, a lot of times people, because they're intimidated, uh, or the devil's lying to them, tell them, you know, well, you're just making stuff up, you still have to do the same mechanics. First, you've got to decide you're going to speak. I'm spirit-filled. I ask and I receive. So I am going to speak in tongues, because the Bible says I can. Paul even says I should. And then I have to make that decision, take a breath, lift my voice, and speak out the new sounds. And again, they sound strange at first. But once you understand it's the Holy Spirit giving you the sounds, the new language, you can relax and enjoy the Holy Spirit indwelling in you to give you that utterance. Amen? Amen. Thank you for that one amen from my wife. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good to have Morgan and Kia with us this morning. Praise the Lord. Glad you guys are with us. All right. So he laid his hands on them, and they began to speak in tongues. Every born-again Christian, if you're born again, you have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in you. Now, it's not the Holy Spirit, because remember, triune Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Okay. So you get born again, you are recreated, you now have the Father, His life indwelling in you, you now have Jesus, His Spirit, His life indwelling in you, but you, the third thing is receive the Holy Spirit. Then you've got the triune Godhead dwelling in you. That's powerful. Hallelujah. All right. You received the life of God, you received the nature of God, we read that Two weeks ago, I think it was. Or maybe it was last week. I'm not sure. The life and nature of God. But Jesus said you'll receive another comforter. Now let's go to John chapter 14. By the way, while you're doing that, I, I, I don't think anybody can tell, but I lost 10 pounds over the last three weeks. Hallelujah. I'm working on it. I'm, I, had, I had no ice cream for three weeks until yesterday. And then I had two small scoops. That's all I had. That was really good. So I finally wanted some ice cream. <laughs> but the rest of this week, tomorrow through next next weekend, no ice cream. That That's only one of the things, you know, people have different things to deal with. That's one of the issues I had to deal with. So I'm dealing with it, praise God. All right. So by next week, I expect to be down at least another three pounds. How many agree with me? All right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. You got John chapter 14? Yep. All right. Verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go. What's he doing? Uh, he's, he's about ready to leave, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And, and listen. If I go... And prepare a place for you, I will come again. So he promised us something, right? He left the earth. The disciples saw him. He was caught up. They saw that. So he left. He hasn't come back yet, despite some people who say he has, and he's in their church. He's here, but not physically. He's here in the spirit. Amen? Amen. He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Now that's at the rapture of the church. That's not the second coming, it's the rapture. When he comes, the Bible says, in the clouds, we will be caught up to meet him in the air. It doesn't say he's coming down and setting up his kingdom and then we'll go visit him in Jerusalem. It says we will be caught up. Well, here he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, ye that there ye may be also. In other words, it will be able to be with the Lord. Amen? Amen? Then let's jump down to verse 16. He says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. What's the word another mean? There's a it means there must be at least one already, and he's going to add another one. See, Jesus was the physical comforter of the church while he was on the earth. 
He was the one that could teach and exhort and minister and pray and miracles would take place and so forth. He was the Lord of our lives. But he says, I'm leaving and I'm going to come back. But until then, I'm going to give you another comforter, somebody else. That's the Holy Ghost. All right, so I will pray the Father. He shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. So you can't see a spirit unless the Holy Spirit allows you through, through the um, discerning of spirits to see into the spirit realm. You cannot see the Holy Ghost. You cannot see spirit beings, angels, and so forth. Now, with the discerning of spirit, by the way, it is not a spirit of discernment. You understand that? Nobody has the spirit of discernment. You can be led by the spirit and discern things, but that's not a gift. That's the Holy Spirit speaking in ministry, revealing things to you. Discerning of spirits is exactly what it says. You discern, you may not see them with your physical eyes, but you can discern them when that gift is in operation. That's not even a ministry. It's a gift of the Spirit. And it's always applied as the Spirit wills. So there'll be times when He allows you to see into the Spirit realm, and you can see things that you can't see with your physical eyes, although it will appear just as real. Amen? So, the Spirit of truth, who the world cannot receive because it cannot it's, it sees him not. Neither knoweth him because, uh, uh, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be, where? In you. So now this is Jesus talking. He said, ask the Father. The Father is going to give you another comforter. He's telling him, I, I'm not going to be around for a while. And then while I'm gone, I, 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 the Father is going to send another comforter to be here with you until I come back and receive you. So we have all three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, involved. Amen? All right, so he, verse 18 says, I will not leave you comfortless, and I will come to you again. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we have the promise of, of two things there. One, one being that he's not going to leave us comfortless. He's going to, the Father is going to give us another comforter to be with us until Jesus comes back. And the second promise is he's coming back. Hallelujah. But that the whole point of, that I'm getting at here is that once you are born again and have been baptized in the Holy Spirit or received the infilling, indwelling, baptism, whatever you want to call it, that all of a sudden now you have the third part of the Trinity, the third part of the Godhead. You've been born again, you got the nature of God. You, you, you got Jesus dwelling in you, in the Spirit. You got His life. But you don't have the third part of the Trinity, but when you receive the Holy Spirit, you get that. And now you are filled with the Spirit. Well, He's the teacher of the church, the Bible says. He's the comforter of the believers. Amen? All right. He is the Spirit of wisdom and might, right? So when He dwells within you, all these things that are used to describe the Holy Spirit are in you. Well, if He's the uh, Spirit of might, if he's the comforter of the church, if he's the spirit of truth, Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will remind you of everything I've said, and he will teach you and show you things to come. He's the teacher of the church. He's the revealer of things to come. So if he then is in you, if you're spirit-filled, how do you know if you're spirit-filled? Well, you speak it in tongues. Amen. Did you ask for the Holy Spirit? See, those are, the, those are the things. If you didn't get it when you got born again, then you need to ask for the Holy Spirit. The Bible says God will give you what you ask for. He'll give you the Holy Spirit. And if you receive them by faith, now you can speak in tongues. So if you haven't done that, you ought, you ought to just go home, get in the closet, shut the door, get by yourself, and, and just say, Holy Spirit, I ain't leaving this room until you give me my language. And whatever strange sounds begin to come to you, Remember, you ask for this. You ask the Holy Spirit, and He's going to teach you a language. But you got to have the guts to speak them out. And if you get embarrassed, you know, with people around, go lock yourself in the bathroom. Shut the door. Turn the fan on when they can't. Turn the water on so they can't hear you. And get in there and speak out the sounds as they come to you. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. Why? Because the Spirit of truth wants to indwell you. And He wants to teach you. He wants to reveal things to you. We've been talking about being led by the Spirit. 
how God guides us through our spirit. Well, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where does he reside? In the, in the extra guest bedroom? <laughs> no, down in the hotel, that's, you know, down the street. No, he resides in you because he is a spirit being, and we are a spirit being. And the Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I think that's amazing. People miss that. He dwells in us. In us. Amen? And so when we finally recognize that, we need to begin to have some confidence in his indwelling presence. He's in there to teach me. He's in there to remind me, recall to my remembrance the things that Jesus has talked about. He's in there to, to give me wisdom, spirit of wisdom. Amen? He's in there to show me things that are, are to come. And, and sometimes we don't recognize the Holy Spirit talking. But we do recognize the promptings of the Spirit from time to time. We do recognize the, the impressions. Remember, the Holy Spirit doesn't make you do anything. He'll speak to you sometimes. He'll impress you sometimes. He'll move on you sometimes. You, you know, I felt impressed or, you know, something told me. That's all part of what we've been talking about, being led by the Spirit. The Spirit of God dwelling in you gives you more access, direct access, to the wisdom of God. To the, the, and really the wisdom of God includes telling you things to do or not to do for your own good. Hallelujah. All right. John chapter 4. Let's go to verse 10. John chapter 4, verse 10. Again from the Amplified Translation. Jesus answered her and said, If you had only known... And had recognized God's gift and who this is that is saying to you, give me to drink. You would have asked him instead, and he would have given you living water. Verse 14, but whoso, whoever takes a drink of the water that I will give him shall never, no, never be thirsty anymore. But the water that I give him shall become a spring or a well. One, the King James, I think, says a well. A spring or a well of water welling up, flowing, bubbling, coming up, all right, just like a well comes out of the ground, right? You dig a well, if you've never done that. You, the closest thing, we've, if we've all been to the beach, you can get up away from the water and you can start digging down. What appears to be dry sand very quickly becomes wet sand. If you keep on digging, it becomes a well or a pool of water. Well, that, that's just like when we dig a well on a piece of property inland, you dig down far enough, there's what's called a water table, and eventually you hit that water table. Uh, in most places, they say it's about 20 feet down. And, and uh, you know, you get digging down there, of course, you don't go in the backyard and take a shovel and start digging. Uh, you don't want to dig a 20-foot hole and get down to the bottom of it, you're gonna have trouble getting out. But, but when we dig wells, they, dig, they get a, a, a well digger in there, and they've got a machine, and they'll dig down. They'll tell you when they hit water. And then, uh, of course, digging a well, they'll go further than where they hit water to make sure that in drought time you still got water. But it's a, it's a well of water that springs up from below, all right? And it provides, what, what, does, what is the need for a well? Why would a person dig a well? To have access to water. Why? Because they, it's part of life. It's part of sustaining. Okay, we need water for life, right? Whether you whether farming, drinking, you need water for life. You can't survive very long without water. So when he, when he says, what I'm giving to you, he said, if you would ask me, uh, I will give him, uh, okay, but the water that I will give him shall become a spring or a well of water welling up, flowing and bubbling, Continually, normally with a water well, it's coming out of the ground, okay? But he's talking about something in us, that the Holy Spirit will begin to move in our lives. He talks about a well. When you get born again, you got the well, not the Holy Spirit part yet. You got the well because Jesus is life, amen? Okay, he, we got the new life in Christ. So he says, the water I give will be like a well, springing up, bubbling continually within him, unto and into or for eternal life. Water nourishes, refreshes. 
That's the new birth. You get nourished, you get refreshed, you get renewed. Amen? And the well is for our benefit. If you have to dig a well on your property, it's for your benefit, isn't it? Well, the well that Jesus gives us, the new birth, is for our benefit. It redeems us from the curse. It removes that thing that the devil has tried to do in our lives or in the world. Now, you stop and think about a river flows out and nourishes others, doesn't it? A river does more than just nourish you, right? He says the new birth is like a well to bring refreshing and nourishing, watering. It's for you. But when he talks about the Holy Spirit, he talks in terms of a river. And, and, and a river will go beyond just your needs. You can take water from a river, and the river can keep on flowing. You can even dam up a river to a degree and get water from your own pond or pool, but eventually it's going to fill up and overflow, and it's going to keep on going, right? And, and so when we go down to John chapter 7, let's go there. Again, Amplified Translation. John chapter 7, verse 33 Therefore Jesus said, For a little while I am still with you, and then I go back to him who sent me. Now what's he telling the disciples? Who sent him? The Father. Amen. And where's he going back to? There. The Father. Which is where? Heaven. In heaven. Okay? So he says in verse 34, You will look for me, but you will not be able to find me. Where I am, you cannot come. In other words, you can't go to heaven until the time. You can't go there yet. Not as long as you're in the physical body or until a rapture takes place. Then our physical body gets caught up and we are in our physical body that's now the glorified body that can never die again. Amen? So he's saying you cannot go where I'm going right now. You can't go. You're still on the earth living a natural life. Verse 35. Then the Jews said among themselves, where, where does this man intend to go that we shall not find him? Will he go to the Jews who are scattered in the dispersion among the Gentiles and teach the Greeks. By the way, there was a, a when they talked in terms of Gentiles, literally what that means is people without God. So they could be talking about Greeks, they could be talking about Romans, they could, any, any group of people that is not uh, a child of God is a Gentile. So in one place that says you were Gentiles, you were without God. But now we are grafted in. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, so they're asked, they're questioning, what does the statement of his mean? You will look for me and not be able to find me, and where I am, you cannot come. So go to verse 37. Now on the final and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood, and he cried in a loud voice, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. So there's the well, right? You got that? He's the well. He's springing up inside of us to nourish and water and refresh us. Verse 38, He that believes on me, who cleaves to and trusts in and relies on me as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living water. But, verse uh, 39 tells us who, what he's talking about. But he was speaking here of the Spirit, whom those who believe and trust and have faith in him were afterwards to receive, for the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified and raised to honor. So he's talking about two different things. He's talking about the well of water, which is the new birth, Jesus living in us. But there's going to come a time for every believer to have the opportunity to have the river of water flowing from us. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because that is meant to flow out from us. Now when he told the disciples, go tarry in Jerusalem until you be do with power on high, another one says, uh, go wait for the, the what was promised by the Father, the Spirit, he's talking about. Okay, he said, go wait. He said, you're going to be just struggling enough <laughs> uh, with dealing with this on your own. But when you're empowered with the Spirit, you'll be my witnesses. What, what's happening? The river begins to flow from us. It's, it's good that we get refreshed, but it's better to not only get the refreshing and the life-giving water of the Spirit, but to be an instrument 
to be used by the Lord to reach out and minister to others. Amen? So we, if you're spirit-filled today, you not only have the well of life, you have the river of life. You got the well for you and the river to flow out of you to others. Hallelujah. See, wells normally don't turn into rivers. They're separate things. Right. Well comes up out of the depths of the earth, right? So the river of life comes up out of our spirit. That's Jesus refreshing us. But then the river is another experience altogether. It's totally different from the well. It's really not meant personally, because we got the well already. It's meant to flow out and water others and minister to others. Hallelujah. All right, so it's a second experience. So when you got born again, you drink the water of life from the well. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you then become a river or allow the Holy Spirit to flow from you to, be, to water others and minister to others. All right. So getting back to being led by the Spirit, uh, you, you've got to, not only do we have to have confidence that the Lord is dwelling in us, but you really, if you haven't received the baptism or the infilling, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you want that river part also. You want that part because you want to be able to be used by God to minister to others. Amen? And some people have a hard time with that, but then so I've seen people that, that were uh, very introverted. They get born again. They're still kind of introverted. All of a sudden, they receive the Holy Spirit. They become a different person. All of a sudden, they're out witnessing to people. They're talking to people. They're sharing testimonies with people. Why? Because the river can't be contained. You can dam it up. It's going to overflow the banks. Once you have the Holy Spirit, you can't contain what's in you. And if you're trying to contain it, you're hindering the flow of the Spirit. Well, I don't believe in witnessing to people because, you know, I don't want to harass them. I don't want to bother them. But yet, He's given us the Holy Spirit to flow His life out to others. Which means we've got to interact with other people. We've got to learn to trust the Spirit dwelling within. But we also have to learn to trust the Holy Spirit that is moving through us to reach out to other people. Everybody say amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good to have Jennifer Rosa with us this morning. Glad to see you're watching. Praise the Lord. Don uh, Gross, Tom and Don, good to have you guys watch. I hope both of you are watching. Praise the Lord. Now, the second thing I want to get at this morning is becoming in, God inside minded. Changing the way we think, changing our thoughts so that we begin to have a constant um, awareness of the presence of God in us. Hallelujah. The presence of God in us. I mean, you stop and think about it. Man, God is dwelling in you. If you're born again, now if you're not born again, he's not. If you're not born again, the devil's dwelling in you. We want to get rid of that death, Amen. But when you're born again, God is dwelling in you. Jesus, his spirit, is dwelling in you. And then you receive the Holy Spirit. Now the Trinity, all together, is dwelling in you and working in you and through you to others. But we get we got to get our mind renewed to the point that we understand that. We start expecting that. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 from the King James translation. You are the temple. It says ye are, but I put it into our English. Ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. He's going to not only live in us, he's going to walk in us. That means every step you take, he's taken. Well, that is as long as you're being led by him. <laughs> You might take a step into the wrong place. He ain't going in there with you. <coughs> Go to that local bar or club and get yourself a drink. Uh, he ain't going in there. So we want him to walk in us. We better make sure we're walking in the right places. Amen? Amen? Amen. I will walk in them. I will dwell in them. I will be their God. He didn't say I, I'd be everybody's God. I'm going to be the God of the people that allow me to dwell in them. Hallelujah. To be our God. That's a covenant promise. That's a covenant partner. Because in covenant, when the two enter into covenant, they now have given themselves to each other. 
We belong to God. But he also belongs to us. That's the great thing about covenant. We couldn't give him anything except us. He gave us everything. <laughs> He's our God. That's a very specific thing. I will be their people. I, I will be their God. And they will be my people. Now the Jews apply that to them. But in the New Testament it applies to everybody that receives Jesus. Everybody that allows God to indwell them. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. When you got born again, you were restored back to the pre-fall condition <clears throat> before Adam fell. What'd you get back? You got back the life of God because Adam had the life of God. You got back the nature of God. Adam had the nature of God. Any being that can walk and talk with God from the day he's created must have the life and nature of God in him. Uh, we watched recently we watched that the Santa Claus movie I think it's number two where the robot uh, you know they, they make a robot to take uh, Tim Allen's character Santa Claus and he has to go back and he's got this the, the Mrs. Claus he's got to get married so he makes the robot to take his place a and um, <laughs> the robot doesn't have the nature of Santa <laughs> amen when I, I, I'm, it's it I, I looked at that and I thought about that, and I thought, there, there's a false replacement. Holy, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't give you anything false. He gives you the real. Amen? We don't want something false. We don't want what the world has to offer, because it won't have the nature of God in it. It won't have the life of God in it. But when you begin to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you, and you allow Him to renew your mind through the Word, allow Him to renew your thinking by the Word, Allow him to get your emotions under control, again, through the word. All this is, it is submitting to the word, really. Amen? You receive back what Adam lost. Life of God, nature of God, authority of God. Authority. Remember the crown of thorns? The crown is always symbolic of dominion and authority. A king, his crown represents dominion and authority that that king has. Well, Adam was given a crown. It was called the crown of glory. It represents the glory of, of God's nature and life and dominion and authority given to Adam to rule over the creation called, well, we call it earth, but the creation was, we discover later, it was everything God made. It was all of God's handiworks. Everything. The sun, moon. He's, at one place he says, God, you know, this is amazing. Why are you so mindful of man that you would give him dominion and authority over all your handiworks, the sun, the moon, the stars? So we're not talking about just this earth. We're talking about dominion over creation itself. Adam had it. Adam lost it. Actually, he gave it away. We get back fellowship with God. Adam had fellowship with God. When you get born again, you got that back. Hallelujah. And Adam had the indwelling presence of God because he was created from his very being. When the Bible says God breathed into Adam, by the way, Adam, Adam, means God's blood. He was created from God himself and God breathed his life and his nature into Adam and he became a living being. A speaking spirit, one translation says. We got it back. We're partakers of the life and nature of God once again. Amen? The Bible says in John 4, 24, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, if he's a spirit, God's not a mind. You get that? He's a spirit, not a mind. We don't have a big brain sitting around somewhere that we worship. <laughs> so he's not a mind. God is not reason. God is not emotion. God is not flesh. God is not feeling. God is not experience. You've heard people say, I heard this growing up. Well, experience is the best teacher. No, it's not. It's the worst. The Holy Spirit's the best teacher. We get that idea that experience is the best teacher, then, then we start blaming God for everything. Well, you know, I had a car accident because God wanted to get me in the hospital, so I administered the person in the bed next to me in my room. Experience becomes your teacher. No, that's that's false. That'll get you killed. Yep. 
The Holy Spirit is our teacher. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. So, he's not experienced. God dwells in our spirits. He communicates with us primarily by and through our spirit. You don't have to be spirit-filled to hear from God, but it does help. Having the Holy Spirit, if I can say it this way, amplifies what God is saying to us in that still, small voice. It's like right now, I've got, I've got a microphone on. we got it hooked up to an amplifier and our speakers. So, not that I need it here. I, I can talk loud enough without it. But it amplifies it. Gives a little more clarity to it. You can hear it a little bit better. Amen? Amen. Well, when you are filled with the Spirit, we now have... Let me, let me use this illustration. We have the great amplifier inside of us. He amplifies what God is speaking to us in our spirit man. And then he reveals it to us and it actually adds to it by giving us the wisdom about what God is saying. That's the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. All right. Remember the inward witness? The still small voice? That's how God speaks to us. But then he gives us the Holy Spirit to allow the Holy Spirit then to nudge us. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Give you a little, little elbow a little bit. Oh, remember the word said? Remember what Jesus said? Tap you on the shoulder. Uh, remember what the word says about this? Amen? So the Holy Spirit dwelling within us takes the things that God is saying because the Bible says he doesn't ever speak of himself. He said, but he'll tell you what I've said and remind you and then he'll show you things to come. So we have that next level, if you want to say, of spiritual life that goes beyond the still small voice in the sense that we don't lose the still small voice, but the Holy Spirit now amplifies it, makes it more able, us more able to hear what God is saying. John 14, 23, Amplified Translation. Jesus answered, he said, if a person really loves me, he will keep my word. If you really love the Lord... You will keep his word. You will be a doer of the word. I, I hear people all tell you, well, I love the Lord, but they don't keep his word. They're going out and doing stuff they shouldn't be doing, talking ways they shouldn't be talking, drinking things they shouldn't be drinking. They say they love the Lord. They're liars. Because if they love the Lord, they wouldn't do those things. They'd say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not going that way anymore. I understand temptation and the weakness of the flesh. But there comes a point you have to make some decisions. There comes to a point where you've got to finally decide to allow the Holy Spirit to direct you. And when you go to do some of the things you did before when you were a sinner, and, and the Holy Spirit now is in you, and he'll, he'll talk to you. Say, hey, what are you doing? I do that with Mary a lot. I think I got that from uh, Tim Allen with the uh, last man standing, you know. Every time uh, his wife goes to do or somebody goes to do something, ah, ah, you know. I do that a lot because I can do that faster than I can stop and explain to Mary why she shouldn't do something that I think she shouldn't do. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> well, the Holy Spirit's going to get your attention somehow. And if you ignore that, you're about ready to go into sin again. If you ignore the prompting, that, that voice of your spirit, the Holy Spirit speaking through your spirit, that impression, that thought, don't go in that place don't do this, then you're about ready to step over into sin. That's the devil's territory. When you do that, you open the door for the devil to attack you. And all the time, there's a voice of your spirit speaking to you, and the Holy Ghost amplifying it, speaking to you, telling you don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, you know better. Asking you questions like, is that how a Christian is supposed to act? Is that the way a Christian is supposed to live? The Holy Spirit will do that. The Bible says he'll even convict us. Some people confuse that with condemnation. Holy Spirit doesn't condemn us. He convicts us. He reminds us of who we are in Christ. He reminds us that, that we are a new creation. That old man is dead. Don't let that old man rise up and control you anymore. Get your mind renewed. Get your emotions controlled. Get your body under control. Be, be the one who has dominion over the creation called you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
If a person really loves me, he will obey my teaching. Now listen to the results. And my Father will love him. And we, plural, Jesus and the Father, we will come to him and make our abode, our home, our dwelling place with him. I don't want to kick the Holy Spirit. I don't want to evict the, the Holy Spirit. I don't want to evict Jesus from my life. I don't want to evict the Father from my life. I want him to be with me. That was the promise they gave. He said, when you keep my word, we can dwell on you. We can come and, and, and live with you on a daily basis. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not discern and understand that you, the whole church, are God's temple, his sanctuary, and that God's spirit has his permanent dwelling place in you to be at home in you, collect, now listen, collectively as a church, and also individually. Hallelujah. God's Spirit has His home, His dwelling place in you. He's in us as the church, but He's also in us individually. Amen? Amen. We need to begin to meditate on these verses until we become in God inside minded. Why do we meditate on the, Because it's the word that's telling us about God's indwelling presence. And, and it's easy to forget God's in me. You get out there in the world and you get confronted with a situation or a temptation. It's easy to forget, wait a minute, God's walking in me. He sees this. The Spirit of God's in me. He's telling me not to do this, not to say this, not to go that direction. Amen. Good to have Karina with us this morning. Hallelujah. So we need to meditate these verses until we become so aware of God's presence, not just in church on Sunday mornings, but in us every single day, 24 hours a day, 24-7, 365. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Amen? God is with us wherever we go. He's our God. He will walk in us and dwell in us, and He gives us the Holy Spirit to teach us, to guide us, to direct us, to give us wisdom and insight and show us things to come. <laughs> I'd hate to be one that that uh, rejected the Holy Spirit. And I get down the road and something happens. I say, why didn't God tell me? Why didn't God warn me? He tried to get you filled with the Spirit, and you reject it. And when you reject the Holy Spirit, you reject the revelation of things to come. We lose out sometimes by rejecting or turning. And that rejection doesn't have to be necessarily an outward rejection of, the, rejection of the Holy Spirit receiving him or the baptism. But sometimes it's just that rejection of his instructions. No. You have that impression. Go here, do this, turn left, turn right, stop, go, you know, whatever he's telling you to do. And, and you ignore that. You rejected the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. He's trying to, he may not show you exactly what's coming, but he's trying to direct you around it. A detour. So you don't have to go through that. So we don't want to reject the Holy Spirit. Amen? So we need to become God inside minded. And then I want to, I want to go on to the next segment, which is learning to trust the Spirit. Sometimes we don't trust the Spirit. Well, I, I, I felt like I had an impression, but I, I'm not sure. You haven't learned to trust the voice of the Spirit yet. Now, this can, can come two ways. One is a decision to trust and, and obey. We used to sing a song, just trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus, just to trust and obey. Amen? I don't know, didn't know I knew all those words still. <laughs> it just came to me as I started saying it. We've got to learn to trust and obey. That's an act of faith. Now, you can take 40, 50 years or longer till you finally have enough experience where you finally learn as an elderly person to trust the Lord. A lot, of, a lot of people don't get it until they're elderly. They finally give up fighting. They finally realize, eh, God knows what he's doing. I just, I'm going to yield to him. We ought to get it now. Don't wait till we're about ready to pass on to another, uh, pass on to another realm. Pass on to the Lord. Amen. We ought to get it now so we can live this life in victory. See, God doesn't want us in defeat. He doesn't want us in failure. He wants us in victory. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
First Corinthians chapter two, verse seven. How much time I got left? Oh, I can do this. First Corinthians chapter two, verse seven, King James. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now keep those phrases in mind. The wisdom of God, but it's a mystery, right? Even the hidden wisdom. So now he says it's a mystery because it's hidden. The hidden wisdom of God or mysteries, which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew. Had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they knew the wisdom of God, what would happen because Jesus dying on the cross, going into hell, paying the price, and being resurrected from the dead, if they knew that, if the devil understood that, he would never have tried to get Jesus killed. So it says, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen. Now he's talking about the flesh, isn't he? I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man. The, the heart of man talks about our, our uh, intellect in this case. All right? Neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them to love him. But, but, there's always a big but there, right? But, and this one is not unbelief. God hath, what's past, what's What's happening? Past tense, right? right? Mm -hmm. God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things, and if I can say it this way, the hidden things, the mysteries that have been hidden. He searches all the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. If the Spirit of God knows all the things of God, the hidden wisdom, the hidden mysteries, the secret things, and He's in us, then guess what? We can have access to Him. He's not withholding anything from us. He's giving us the opportunity to tap in to a wealth of wisdom, insight, knowledge of God. Amen? He hath revealed them to us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God, Verse 11, for what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received, say we have received, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might what? That we might know. Why did he give us the Holy Spirit? That we might know. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Let's go on. First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4. He says, my speech and my preaching was not by, you see how this is in Corinthians where he talks about the gifts of the Spirit, the operation of the gifts and ministries. So now he, he talks about the wisdom of God, talks about things hidden in a mystery. That was First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7, but go back up to verse 4. He says, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words, of man's wisdom. All right, so stop right there. What did man's wisdom teach you? Words. He's talking about words, didn't he? My preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. So what kind of words did man's wisdom teach you? Well, born in this country, English words, right? We learn English in this country. All right, that's the official language. Uh, if you were in France, maybe you, know, you, you would have learned French growing up. If you're in Italy, you would have learned Italian growing up. But he's saying here, the, what I preached to you did not come from man's wisdom. I didn't speak words that came from man's wisdom or education or teaching. But in demonstration of the Spirit, now he's giving you a clue to where his words came from. In demonstration of the Spirit and power. So he specifically references words taught by human understanding. And then he switches over and says, but it came by the Spirit. And in the words I speak, that in itself should be a demonstration of the Spirit power. Not counting the miracles and all the signs and wonders that are attached to it. So not in words of man's wisdom. So go to verse 12. Chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12. 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Verse 13. Which things also we speak. He says, we're speaking out the things that God's giving us. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost teaches. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Am I the only one here that's warm? Huh? Okay. Other people warm? Somebody sing or do something. Hang on for a minute. I don't hear you singing. I didn't want you to hear me blowing my nose. I need a little silver trash can right here. Hallelujah. Excuse me, all of you watching on Facebook and, and Twitter, and, and I guess I'll put that in my pocket, <laughs> and uh, Periscope and, and YouTube. I'm sorry. It, uh, when I start getting warm, I, maybe I shouldn't confess this anymore. I, I, I always have said my nose starts sweating, and it does. Um, so I'm changing that. I'm not going to say it anymore. I'm saying my nose doesn't sweat anymore. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So he says... Um, we speak the wisdom of God, which not the wisdom that came from man's words, but which comes by the Holy Ghost, he says there in verse 13. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. In other words, once we are gaining the knowledge and the wisdom of God, he's giving us, he's giving us words to speak. He's speaking words of the Spirit to us. Once we start experiencing that, then we can compare the things in, the, in our world with the things in the spirit realm in God's world and we can see if they line up or not and if they don't line up what do we do we change them with the word with the name of Jesus with the gifts of the spirit with the power of God hallelujah now go to 1 Corinthians 14 some of you have already got this link but I uh, want you to see it again 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue. Well, what's an unknown tongue? Well, yeah, but could it be Italian? Sure. It's for some people. It's a heavenly language. we got to understand that tongues is a heavenly language. Yeah. Now, he may give somebody a natural interpretation in their language, but the words we speak are not an earthly language. Okay? He says, He that speaketh an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. How be it, in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Well, wait a minute. We've heard that phrase before. We're now speaking out mysteries. First, he says the Holy Spirit revealed those hidden mysteries the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery in words not taught by man but words taught by the Holy Ghost so now he says we speak out these hidden mysteries these secrets that the Holy Spirit is teaching us amen in the spirit we speak mysteries 1 Corinthians 14 again go to verse 13 wherefore let him that speaks in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. There's where the natural language comes in. Taking it from the spiritual language of tongues, which we don't understand, and interpreting it into the natural language of the language we know. Amen? I, I've shared with you before, there's two times I've experienced this uh, that I know of, uh, where one time it was uh, a Jewish man and he spoke Hebrew, and he'd been educated in the, in the high form of the Hebrew language. And he came to me after service, and he said, I appreciate you sharing those things in, in my language. I didn't even know the guy was there, much less that he was Jewish. And, and uh, I said, what, what are you talking about? He said, well, when you were praising God there, you were doing it in my language. And it was a high form, a very educated form of Hebrew. I don't know how many forms there are. I don't know what that means other than it must be something you got to be highly educated to understand. I said, well, what about I say? He said, you were praising God and giving glory to God and talking about all the glorious things of God. I was just praising God in tongues, all I was doing. But the Holy Spirit gave him the interpretation. I was not speaking Hebrew. I was speaking in tongues, an unknown language. But he heard unknown language as the interpretation. 
The second time that happened to me happened to be a gentleman that spoke Arabic, and he almost identical situation. He came up afterwards, and, and again thanked me for sharing the things I shared in his language. I, and again, I, I, what are you talking about? He said, "Well, you know, when you were talking about the glorious things of God." I said, well, "When was that?" He said, you know, you were up here and you were talking. I said, "I don't know Arabic." He says, you got to be kidding. He said, you were speaking perfect. He says, in fact, and he, he almost said the exact same thing. He said that was a high form of Arabic. That was not just a common street language. So I don't know Arabic. He says, really? I said, no, never learned it. Don't know one word. I said, that was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave me a, a, a word that I didn't know. I was just praising God. I didn't know it was speaking to somebody. So you never know for sure. You just... Let the Spirit of God minister to you and you're praising God. And sometimes things will come out of you. And as tongues, it's a, it's a heavenly language. It's an unknown. The Bible says unknown. So it's an unknown language. But he heard it in his language. That's the Holy Spirit giving an interpretation. Revealing to him some reality that he didn't have before. Hallelujah. Praise God. So. He said, we speak the hidden wisdom of God. Verse 13 there says, let him that speaks in, in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Why is my understanding unfruitful? I have no idea what I'm saying when I'm praying in tongues. It is not my earthly language. It's a heavenly language. All right. But he goes on and says, I should pray that I interpret. Why? Because my mind's unfruitful. My mind gets no benefit. The wisdom of God has to go from the spirit to the natural. It has to come out in a way we can use it and apply it. Whether it's through a tongue with an interpretation in our English language or whatever language we speak, or it's uh, the Holy Spirit just speaking to us direct. However the Holy Spirit ministers to it, in order for us to benefit, it's got to be something we can understand. Right? That's why Paul says that if there's nobody interpreting a service, then let the speaking in tongues as message ministry be limited to two or at most three. He says, but let somebody interpret. And if there's nobody to interpret, then let them be silent. Let them speak to God. See, there's two forms of speaking in tongues. One is you speaking to God in tongues. That's nobody's business. But then there's the message where we speak out a message above the crowd. We speak louder and we speak out something to minister to people. And if we do that and nobody interprets, then we need to just be quiet and take it to God. Amen? All right. So, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. By the way, that's also how you calm down your mind. You pray in tongues until your mind gets calm because your mind is not fruitful during praying in tongues. And so you want to shut down the stuff that's going on that's harassing you and start praying in tongues and give it enough time, your mind will calm down. And if it hadn't calmed down yet, you haven't been praying long enough. Five minutes won't do it most of the time. If you've got to shut down all the weird thoughts and stuff going on, the fears and anxieties in your mind, you need to pray in tongues some more because it will shut down your mind. Your mind becomes unfruitful. It can't produce. All right. So, verse 15. So what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. And I will pray with the understanding also. In other words, and he goes on, by the way, he says, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with my understanding also. There's a time when we need to take it from the Spirit into the natural so our minds can understand it. That's where the interpretation of tongues comes in. That's where... Uh, in, this, in this particular case, we're dealing with speaking out words that man didn't teach, but the Holy Ghost taught in order to reveal something to us, but then it has to have interpretation so that our minds can benefit from what the Holy Spirit is saying. Now, that's not the most common way. In, in fact, the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, we should need less and less in our lives as we grow up spiritually. Because that's God having to do something beyond speaking to you by His Spirit. I mean, you know, it's, it's sad when we, we need a word from God to know what we should do about something. When God's been speaking to you the whole time, before you ever got to the point, I want a word from God, He's already given you the word inside, and you didn't hear it. You didn't listen. You weren't tuned in. So then we need a prophecy. We need a word. 
And so somebody comes along and gives us a word. And, and you know, the Bible says the, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. How many know they can actually, uh, sometimes when they give you a word, can add to? Uh, a, a word can be turned into a paragraph, can be turned into a, 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 a page, can be turned into a book. <laughs> But sometimes it's just a word. All you need to know is specific, this is what God is saying. And not make something out of it that's not. Amen? Amen. All right. So, we need to spend more time praying in the Spirit. We need to spend more time meditating on the Word of God. And we also need to spend more time listening. When we pray, be quiet and listen. Too many people pray, and they get up and walk away from their place of prayer... Just as God is about to give them the answer, or the Holy Spirit's about to speak, they're doing all the talking, and, and then they get up and leave. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, you out. Come back. I like to, after I pray, just be quiet for a while. That's why I like to keep a notebook. I fill up a lot of notebooks. Mary fills up more than I do. I like to be ready, and when I get quiet after I've prayed over a situation, I get quiet, and then if, if and when it was something I needed to know, the Holy Spirit can reveal it to me, and I'll write it down. I like to write them down in data, keep track of things. God said this on this date. On this date it was fulfilled. Put that in there. Go back and find it. Put the fulfillment in there. Amen? But keep a notebook handy. Keep something handy where you can write down as things come to you. Now, how do we know that was God? Well, then verify with the written word of God. The Bible says, let everything be, let everything be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So if, if you get something that you feel might be God speaking to you, first establish it with the written word. That's the first place to go. Does this line up with the written word of God? If it doesn't, then it's not God. The second thing, if after you find scriptures that would support what you feel God has said, and you're still not quite confident that maybe this is what, you, then two or three witnesses. Well, that was one witness. So now if you're married, you go to your spouse. If they're a praying person, you lay it out before them. Here's what I feel like God is speaking to me. What do you think about that? Let them have time to pray and get back to you. That's why when people call me and say, Pastor, would you pray about some you know, situation, well, you know, I need to pray about it before we pray about it. I need to get in line with what God wants. I need to know what you're believing. Would you agree with me? Hey, not yet. Not until I know what you're believing for. Well, I, you know, I believe the doctor's going to, well, I'm, I believe in healing. Mm -hmm. So if I pray, I'm going to pray for healing, and you're standing there believing to go to a doctor and have God direct his hands or something in surgery. We're not in agreement. There is no faith released. You understand? People wonder why they don't get healed. We need to get into agreement. That means, what specifically are you believing for? Are you believing to go to the doctor and have an operation and make it smooth? The doctor does whatever needs to be done and everything comes out okay? Okay, I'll agree with you on that. It's not the best, but yeah, if that's what you're believing, I'll agree with you. Amen? But if you come up and say, I want you to know I believe I'm healed, and I want your agreement on that. Man, I'll jump on that. I can agree with that right now. Don't have to wait and pray about it. Let's just agree. Let's get it done. Amen? You see, the Spirit of God wants to direct us into God's best. It's, it's okay that you can have the gifts of Spirit operate in you, but you ought to be ministering the gifts of Spirit to people that are younger in the Lord than you are. You ought to be one that's speaking words to people and laying hands on people and, and prophesying over people. You should be the one that needs all that to walk in victory. If we grow up in the Spirit, then we're going to be getting, begin to hear the voice of the Spirit, and, and that's our word. We got it. We got the written word, and we got the word the Spirit of God spoke to us, and we know in our hearts there's confirmation in our hearts this is God, and we move on and do what God told us to do. But I'm not going to discount the gifts of spirit. If you're at a place where you still need that gift to operate toward you, then I believe that God will do what needs to be done to get through to you. Amen? But as we spend more time renewing our mind to the presence of God in us, 
as we spend more time praying in the Spirit and waiting. What I talked a few weeks ago about waiting on the Lord. We, that's part of what I mentioned this morning. After you pray, wait. Don't get up and run off to do something. Put enough time in your prayer time to allow you time to wait and listen. Wait on the Lord. That's so important. Most, most Christians don't really do that. But what will happen is time goes on, we'll find that the voice of the Spirit is getting louder and louder and louder. And that the Holy Spirit is speaking things to us in greater ways and in, in more areas than we've ever heard before. That doesn't mean, mean we got to go around prophesying to everybody. It's not what it's about. It's about just knowing God's hidden wis wisdom, His mysteries, the secret things about our lives. Because the Bible said there, before the foundations of the world, there was a book of your life written with every day in your life, in God's plan. Now, God also knows what you're going to do. But he's got a perfect plan. I want, when I get up to heaven and I review my life, I want the page for today to declare I walked in 100% God's perfect will for today. I don't want to get halfway down the page reading and say, uh-uh, he stepped out when he did his own thing. Let his emotions get to him. And all this other good stuff God had planned for me today, I missed because I went off and got sidetracked. I got offended. I got upset. I didn't like something. You know, people get offended at the silliest things. I mean, to them it's not so silly, I guess, but they are just flesh is all they are. Reason, emotion, flesh. That's all the natural. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too loud. Music's too loud. Music's too soft. Don't like all men. Want a woman in there. You know, we don't have a piano. Don't have a musician. Uh, I mean, the list goes on. The things the devil will use to get you offended. I don't like when he talks about politics. I don't like when he talks about money. I don't like when he says this. I don't like when. But why don't you? I said this to somebody this morning. The Spirit of God reminds me of this periodically. And as some brother Hagen said, the Spirit of God spoke it to him. To be as smart as a cow, chew the hay but spit out the stubble. Sometimes what we think is stubble is actually God, but we can't distinguish the difference, and we spit out the good stuff that God's trying to say. But that's no reason to get offended. Spit out the stuff you can't accept right now. You can't swallow. Spit it out and wait till another day. You know, cows chew the cud. That means they bring them back up and chew it again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, it's quiet here this morning. <laughs> Sometimes we're choking on something we've heard. Something's happened. Something's going on. We're having the temptation to be offended, get upset. We're resisting that. Just set the thing aside. Don't let it hinder your spiritual welfare. Don't let offense, don't let an attitude stop you and hinder you from moving forward. Because it will, I promise, I guarantee you by the Word of God, getting offended, getting upset, getting a strife, these will hinder your spiritual growth and your steps from that point forward until you get out of it. It's, it's hard to get healed when you got offense and strife in your heart. I remember one time one of my associate pastors uh, went to a woman, uh, was it a woman or a man? I, I, I honestly couldn't tell you right now. Went to somebody in the hospital. I think it was a woman. She had cancer. And uh, he's trying to minister to her, and the Spirit of God says, no, she's, she's got unforgiveness. She can't be healed until she gets rid of that unforgiveness. That's what's killing her, not the cancer. And uh, so he stopped, and he said, uh, you've got unforgiveness in your heart. Who is it that you're holding something in? Who is it you're upset with? Who is it you can't forgive? Oh, well, it's my husband. He did something, and, and she told him the story. And, and she said, I will never forgive him for that. I will take that to my grave. He said, yeah, and you're going to get there a lot sooner than you need to. <laughs> because unforgiveness stops the healing power of God. He said, if you'll forgive him by faith, that doesn't mean the emotions go away. You've got to ask the Holy Spirit to heal the emotions, the hurts. He's the comforter. But if you forgive by faith, then God can heal your body. Nope. Oh, can't forgive him. And she died shortly after that. Now that's kind of a drastic because that's the end of things in the natural. The end of her situation. But there's people out there right now that some are going to hear it now. Some are going to hear it later when they listen to this message. 
and they're going to hear about stopping the flow of God's wisdom into your life, God's healing power and everything else he wants to do because you're holding on to unforgiveness. You're holding on to offense. You're holding on to strife. See, that those are different levels of the same thing. It's a spirit that's gotten a hold of your thinking, gotten a hold of your emotions. So offense breeds strife and unforgiveness. So the first level is getting offended. Something you don't like, something didn't go the way you thought it should go, you know. And it happens in churches. That's that's the biggest divider of churches that there is, offense. And like I said, it's sometimes it's over the silliest things. And there's people out there right now that aren't going to church because they got offended by something the pastor said or maybe a, a greeter said or an usher said or a deacon or an elder said or because something was done in the church and nobody consulted them like they're the ones that got to be questioned whether or not it's okay. Well, they changed the carpets and they never asked me about that. And I tied to that church and they do stuff they didn't ask me about. I'm not tied to that church no more. <laughs> You're not going to hear the voice of the Spirit. All you're hearing is the voice of the devil lying to you. And then some people have the nerve to say, well, God told me I should leave this church because... No, God didn't tell you that. God never tells anybody to leave a church. Man. Quiet, quiet, quiet. <laughs> you people are watching out there. Shout really loud right now so I can... Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> God tells us to forgive. Why? Because if we don't forgive, we're not going to hear the voice, the leading of the Spirit. All we're hearing is the devil lying to us. Hallelujah. Well, that's enough on that. I think I'm out of time. Am I out of time? You say, you got to put the thing on. Now hold it there until I see it. Prop your arm up until I see it. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was easier when it was in the back. I, I couldn't miss it. I don't look that way very often. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, we thank you this morning. We thank you for bringing forth wisdom. We thank you for bringing forth revelation. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for ministering to us individually. Oh, Holy Spirit, we give you glory even though you don't ask for it. Because you, you are patient with us. Because you're constantly ministering and trying to reveal that hidden wisdom of God to us. And you never give up on us, Holy Spirit. We thank you for that. Now, Father, I thank you. I thank you first that you're living in us, that you've made your home in us. We thank you that you are our God. We are your children, your people. We are in covenant with you. Thank you so much. Now, Father, I pray for every need. People that are here, people that are watching, Holy Spirit, minister to every need this morning. Whatever gifts might be needed, whatever needs to be accomplished, that you are causing it to manifest. People that have watched and listened have had a hungry heart. That's why they tuned in and they want to hear the wisdom of God. Holy Spirit, I thank you for bringing that forth to them for the areas they're dealing with. Hallelujah. Anybody need prayer for anything this morning? Hallelujah. 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 Anybody online that's online watch right now, you need prayer, send me a little note here on Facebook. Uh, on our live service that's going on right now and we'll pray for you I see Karina uh, praise the Lord when I said there you all out there praise the Lord because it's so quiet here and she put a bunch of hand claps and <laughs> and something else which looks like somebody shouting very small on my phone so <laughs> thank you Karina appreciate that somebody's listening amen hallelujah all right nobody in here needs prayer for anything this morning all right, praise God. Well, we're going to move forward then, and I'm, I'm kind of watching to see if somebody has a prayer request online. We're going to go ahead and, and worship God with our giving. So before we do that, let me let 
our internet people go. We love you guys. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if any of you are not partners, we're believing God for 100 partners through the social media. And uh, if you watch us on Facebook or Twitter or Periscope or all our messages now are going to be going on to uh, our YouTube page, which is under Pastor William Emmons. That's how you find it. Make sure you subscribe. But if, if, if we bless you and you're not a partner and you want to be a part of what we're doing and you want to partner with us, we invite you to do that. We'd love to have you as a partner. You go on our daily prayer list when that happens. And there's things that are available to you uh, through that. But the information, how you can give us up here on this banner, that's why we have it in the, in the camera so you can see it. And uh, we got, you can mail your partner gifts to uh, post, box, post Office Box 4238. That's West Hills, California, 91308. You can use PayPal. Go to W. Emmons, E-M-M-O-N-S, 01 at gmail.com. And make sure you use the friends and family option. Otherwise, they're going to take fees out. Don't need to do that. Um, you can also go to our website, Covenant Faith Center Chats with California, and there's a giving and partnership page there if you want to use that. Uh, but they do take fees out of that also, so we have no control over that. Anyway, we love you guys. We look forward, by the way, Wednesday night, we're going to start at 6 o'clock. We're going to continue on this series, Two Kinds of Faith. We're going deeper and deeper into it, so don't miss out. Tuesday night, 6 o'clock, Two Kinds of Faith, part like 125. No, I'm just kidding. Part like 9, I think. Anyway, have a blessed week. We will see you guys when we see you. All right. Praise God.